Now the next topic today is juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibromas, JNA. Nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. It is self-explanatory, juvenile because it is an adolescent males actually. Nasopharyngeal because it is seen in the nasopharyngeal area. Angiofibroma as the name says it has blood vessels and it has got fibrous tissue. So it is juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. A very important topic forms a lot of questions for MCQs. It is the most common benign tumor of the nasopharynx. But though it is benign, it is locally invasive. It is juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. It is seen in young adolescent males. Remember this. And it arises from the sphenopalatine foramen, another MCQ. Now, this very word nasopharyngeal angiofibroma actually means it has got angiomatous tissue, which are blood vessels. And it's got fibrous tissue, but it has no muscle. It has no muscle. So there is no contraction. That is the reason biopsy is contraindicated. Because if there is, if you take a biopsy by mistake in the clinic, it will bleed so much because there is no muscle to contract and the patient can land into serious trouble. Now before we reach the tumor, let us know a little bit about the origin. Where does it come from? It's from the sphenopalatine foramen. Now where is the sphenopalatine foramen? As the name suggests, it has to be somewhere between the sphenoid and the palate. So sphenoid is a midline structure just anterior to the pituitary. And you know where the palate is, it is the roof of your mouth. So it is one centimeter posterior and a little inferior to the middle turbinate. It connects the nasopharynx laterally to the sphenopalatine or the pterygopalatine fossa. Why is the sphenopalatine fossa important? Because it has the sphenopalatine ganglion the maxillary artery and the maxillary nerve. So these are all MCQ questions. It has the sphenopalatine ganglion, the maxillary artery and the maxillary nerve. It lies just behind the maxillary antrum because that is where it is in front of the sphenoid and just about the palate. So as the name suggests, it is a sphenopalatine foramen. Now, what are the boundaries of this foramen? These are, this is important because only when you know the boundaries can you know where all it can go and what are the signs of, a, of an angiofibroma. So, anteriorly, it is a maxillary antrum. Posteriorly, is the pterygoid plate, root of which has a foramen rotundum in the base of the skull through which the maxillary nerve enters the sphenopalatine fossa. Also the sphenopalatine foramen, the, the foramen leading to the pterygoid canal through which the median nerve enters the fossa. Medially is the nasopharynx in which is the perpendicular plate of the palatine bone which contains the sphenopalatine foramen. So sphenopalatine foramen is in the palatine bone. It's in the perpendicular plate of the palatine bone. Laterally is the infratemporal fossa via the pterygomaxillary fissure. The floor is the palate, as I've told you, because it's a sphenopalatine fossa. And it has a palatine canal through which the greater palatine artery enters the palate. And roof is the floor of the orbit which contains the inferior orbital fissure. Actually, if you look at a skull and you see these things, you will realize how easy it is to remember this. Anteriorly is the maxillary antrum. 
behind is the pterygoid plate so this is the maxillary antrum if you look in the anterior posterior way this is the maxillary antrum behind is the pterygoid plate right now why is this phenopalatine foramen so important because the sphenopalatine artery enters the nose through this. This is a branch of the maxillary artery which enters the nose through the sphenopalatine foramen and this is the artery of epistaxis. If the routine measures of epistaxis is not able to control bleeding in a particular patient, you have to enter the sphenopalatine fossa and tie or ligate the sphenopalatine artery there. So this is the artery of epistaxis. And secondly, the origin of angiofibroma. It is the place where angiofibroma originates or starts from. Now, what are the symptoms of a juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma? There's a red fleshy mass on anterior rhinoscopy, which, and you can have profuse epistaxis from one side of the nose. You can have otitis media because it compresses in the eustachian tube and causes secretory otitis media. It flays the nose, it causes proptosis and there is swelling in the cheek because it enters, when it enters the infratemporal fossa. Proptosis because it enters the orbit through the orbital fissure. Swelling in the cheek because it goes into the infratemporal fossa. And frog face deformity is a combination of all this along with broadening of the nose. So all this together forms the frog face deformity. This is again an MCQ question. What are the radiological signs of a juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma? One is the antral sign. The anterior, the anterior wall of the sphenopalatine fossa where it goes is the maxillary antrum. So it pushes the maxillary antrum anteriorly from behind. So that is known as the antral sign or the Holman Miller sign. Now what are the, that means the if this is the maxillary antrum from anterior to posterior, the antrum, the posterior wall of the antrum is pushed. So it becomes concave like this. This is the antrum from anterior posterior. So the, this is known as the Holman Miller sign. The Holman Miller sign, you can see it on a plain x-ray of the lateral wall of the nose. CCT, uh, the most common important investigation is a contrast enhanced CT scan of the paranasal sinuses and the nasopharynx. To see intracranial extension, you need an MRI and a carotid angiography can be done or a DSA digital subtraction angiography is done to see the vessels which are feeding the tumor. There is no muscular coat, so no retraction, so profuse bleeding, biopsy is contraindicated. Do not go for a biopsy in the OPD in, if you are suspecting a nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. Now, the staging of juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma, stage 1, A, when it is confined to the nose and nasopharynx, 1, B, when it extends into any of the paranasal sinuses. 2A, when it is confined to the sphenopalatine fossa. 2B, when there is bowing of the posterior anterior wall or it goes into the orbit. 2C is when it goes into the infratemporal fossa into the cheek. And 3 is when there is intracranial extension. So this bowing of the posterior one is the antral sign. So when you have this, you will have the antral sign here on x-ray, bowing of the posterior antral wall. How do you manage juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibromas? It is surgery is a treatment of choice. You can have endoscopic transnasal surgery. You can have transpalatine, sublabial, medial maxillectomy, lateral rhinotomy, Transmaxillary, 
make facial degloving or infratemporal. These are all approaches depending on where all it's going. If it is confined to the nose and nasopharynx, you can do an endoscopic transnasal. If it's going and going towards the palate, you can do a transpalatine. Extensive surgeries need extensive large nasopharyngeal angiofibromas going almost everywhere need a mid-facial degloving. So depending on where all it's going, you need to remove it accordingly. Intracranial extension, which is not feasible to get operated, are the ones who go for radiotherapy. But whatever be the modality of treatment, whether it is surgical, whether it is transnasal, uh, endoscopic surgery, or facial degloving, the nature of the disease is such that the recurrence rate is very high. Because to reach the splenopalatine foramen and to remove it in toto is sometimes not possible. And these are very aggressive tumors which keep recurring till the age of about 17 or 18. And sometimes when the child grows out of um, adolescent, the tumor recurrence becomes lesser. Thank you.